This is the town of Plainfield, Wisconsin. Home to pretty much the worst, eh, one of the worst human beings ever to ever walk the earth. You know, I feel like a lot of people who love horror movies might not even realize that movies like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and uh, Silence of the Lambs and Psycho, you know, those movies are based off of a real person. Someone who really existed and really did that kind of stuff. And this is the town where he lived. Ed Gein was uh, apprehended on November 16th, 1957. And what they found in his house of horrors will haunt people until the end of time. Graveyard robbing and murder. But I'm gonna take you around, I'm gonna show you the cemeteries that he robbed. I'm gonna take you to the jail that they brought him to after they arrested him, his property, where they found all the horrible stuff, the bodies and the heads and the collections of body parts. Unbelievable, but this is it. Plainfield, Wisconsin, Ed Gein. There was four beds in the drunk tank. And that was technically the room they kept Ed in. Um, so he wasn't with regular public. But this is the room we have him in now. And that's a life-size poster of him. His skis. There's a knife inside the gun case with his guns. Wow. How long was uh, Ed actually here for? Um, the first time he was here for four nights, four days and four nights. Mm -hmm. And then um, they brought him back in 68 for overnight for trial. That's a life-size poster. Wow, so he was... He's little. Yeah, probably, yeah. what, five, five, six, something like that? Oh, no, it's shorter than that. Is it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, little guy. Well, Upstairs was the rubber roll in case they had a, a an issue. Wow. The sheriff's wife could keep an eye on them. Mm -hmm. But it was also the room that they brought the upstairs prisoners in to eat. Oh, this was him? Yeah. How do you spell that? Yeska. Yeska. Carl Yeska. Mm -hmm. Do you know what cell he hanged himself in? Um. I believe it's the one Ed is in. Oh, That's this one? Out. Yeah. Oh, wow. There, there was a pipe up above for the toilet and stuff. Oh, jeez. Do you ever get any uh, paranormal investigators oh. in here? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. In fact, I've uh, got quite a few set up for the next three months. Oh, jeez. So. It was the drunk tank. And there was four beds in there. Now there isn't, of course, but but that's the wow. actual room he was in. Jeez. Man, this is beautiful. Yeah. What's that from? That's from the actual train station. Man, that's nice. Yeah. If you ever seen um, the guys, we are paranormal. They uh, had a picture of Augusta up on the on the desk there mm -hmm. and she knocked it down she didn't like that wow which is Ed's mom this was Augusta here yes wow I've never seen this photo of her yeah. here's the old Gein family property that's my understanding that the house was straight ahead, straight past this fence here, this gate. Ed was born in 1906, but not in this house. Uh, they didn't move here until 1914 when he was eight years old and his brother was 13. It was, it was him, his, his brother George, and his mother and father. And back this way was a big barn and um, some smaller outbuildings. 
some of which had bodies and body parts found inside of them, as well as, of course, the, the house, the main house. And uh, Ed's father died in 1940 at 66 years old of heart failure, most likely due to his heavy drinking. And, you know, his mother was uh, very religious, but in an extreme, kind of a weird way. I'm not saying religion is bad. I'm just saying she was, she had very skewed views of women. She, she did not allow the boys to date in their teenage years. She really did not allow them to socialize that much at all. I mean, it really, her obsessions and her strange way of, of, of raising them really brought that out. I mean, he developed a very strange obsession with his mother from even a young age. In fact, they, there was a brush fire and he and his brother Henry were putting that brush fire out and his brother mysteriously died. You know, he ran into town saying that he lost his brother in the smoke and um, he could not find him. The police came back and they said, well, you know, where do you think he could be? And he ended up leading the police right to his brother who was face down. He hadn't been burned from the fire or anything like that. In fact, I don't think his body was even close to where the brush fire was. And um, it was ruled as uh, smoke inhalation. That's how he died. But many people assume that he probably killed his brother because his brother really had concerns about how their mother was and how he was with his mother. And um, I think that Ed just wanted to be alone with his mother. He just wanted to have his mother all to himself. A little over a year later, December 29th, 1945, his mother died of a stroke. And then Ed was all by himself. He was all alone. He got really into very, very macabre type of stuff. He started reading a lot of weird things. Um, World War II information about deaths. Got, got into taxidermy and things like that. Uh, he just was became almost obsessed with death. It was about two years, 18 months to two years, according to Ed Gein himself, after his mother's passing, that he started visiting the cemeteries. There were three cemeteries in the Plainfield area. You know, he when he would go out to the bars or talk to people, around town, he would say weird things, talk about deaths and things like that. And I think people, you know, they kind of were just like, oh, that's Eddie. You know, they knew he was weird. He was a nice guy, but they knew he was weird. And that's what it was. I mean, he was just a weird guy. Um, I don't think anybody would ever suspect what was actually happening where he was visiting those cemeteries and, uh, and, and digging up bodies and bringing them home. Strange. It was about two years later, like I said, that he started getting into some weird stuff. And he claims to have gone to the cemeteries about 40 times. And of those 40 times, probably 10 times actually dug up some bodies and um, took them back to his house. And this is where the entire Gein family is buried. You'll notice the dirt patch in the middle. That is where Ed Gein's tombstone used to be. His mother, Augusta, his father, George, and uh, his brother, Henry. So I kind of explained how his whole family had passed away or his brother may have been murdered by him. In any event, he was left alone by the time his mother passed away in 1945. Uh, what happened to his tombstone? I think it was stolen and ended up somewhere in like Seattle. And then it was returned years and years later. And now it's, it's somewhere in safekeeping. Over the years before it was stolen, people would take little pieces of it. They would chip pieces of his, of his, uh, tombstone. But um, it's just crazy to think that his body is 
is right there. Now it's confirmed that there were nine bodies unearthed from three cemeteries, with the majority of them being here at the Plainfield Cemetery. And uh, I, I don't know how they identified these people. Most likely it was through him admitting and pointing out which graves he dug up. And if you haven't realized it yet, yes, some of his victims are buried in the same ground at the same cemetery as this monster. Harriet Sherman, who died at 70 years old, November 22nd, 1955. Elsie Sparks was the second body that Ed unearthed, and actually the first body in this particular cemetery. Mabel Everson was the fourth body to be dug up by Ed. And if you think that's messed up, that these people are buried in the same cemetery as the Gein family, you're not gonna like this one. This is Eleanor Adams. Died in 1951, right next to, I mean, directly in line with Ed Gein. In Scott Bowser's book, he wrote, Eleanor's husband, Floyd, was present when they exhumed Eleanor's casket. When they opened the casket, Eleanor's body was missing. Ed later confessed he dug up Eleanor's body the same day she was buried. Eleanor's husband, Floyd Adams, later filed a $5,000 claim against the Gein estate claiming mental suffering. I'd say that's pretty justified. Another one pretty much right next to the Gein family is Marie Bergstrom. And I've also seen this name as Karen Bergstrom, the same dates, 1866 to 1951. So who knows? A few hundred feet away, is uh, a woman that he killed. Now he confessed to killing two different women, two people. But during that time period, there was a couple other people that kind of disappeared or they were killed. And a lot of people think that he killed more, more than just the two, but confirmed it was these two different people. So Bernice Warden was actually the second uh, woman that Ed had admitted to killing. Um, this is a little out of order, but she's right here. So I'm going to show you. But this is her plot right here, Bernice C. Warden. It, it's really how Ed Gein was caught. Um, Bernice owned a hardware store in the town of Plainfield, November 16th, 1957, Bernice's son, Frank, walked into the hardware store after a morning of hunting and found a pool of blood on the floor and a 22 caliber rifle out of place on the store rack. He checked the receipt book and found a purchase of antifreeze that morning by none other than Edward Gein. Frank Worden was aware of Ed's weird mannerisms and contacted the police immediately. In actuality, Ed had walked into the store that morning, purchased that antifreeze, and then asked to see the 22 caliber rifle, and when Bernice wasn't looking, he loaded it with a bullet from his pocket and shot her in the head. The sheriff and his deputy went to the Gein farm, and it was there that they discovered Bernice's body hanging upside down from the rafters and gutted like an animal. And that afternoon, Ed was arrested at a friend's house. And it was that day, November 16th, 1957, that Ed's psychotic tendencies were exposed and people saw what was really going on in that horror house. I mean, there was just, I mean, how do I even go into this? Just body parts. Um, it, gloves made of human skin, um, bowls made of human skulls, collections of body parts, collections of ears and, and uh, skin leggings, uh, just very, very strange things. It almost looked like he was, he wanted to make like a skin suit. He basically wanted to be 
closer to his mother or maybe kind of feel like his mother. That's what most people think. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it's fascinating in a horrible and dark way. Once he was arrested, the house wasn't completely cleaned out, but they certainly took out and cataloged and recorded the really horrific things like the skin covered furniture and things like that. Uh, strangely enough, he had boarded up most of the house once his mother died and just only lived in just a couple rooms. The residents of Plainfield did not like that house there. They did not like that it was becoming a bit of a tourist attraction. People were even then fascinated with this kind of stuff. And just before there was supposed to be an auction where they were going to auction off his house and his property and belongings, the house was mysteriously set ablaze and pretty much everything was lost. And that was that. So now I'm heading to uh, where a tavern used to be that Ed Gein would frequent. So this is where Mary Hogan's tavern was. Uh, he, he took a liking to Mary Hogan because she was of German descent. She kind of was a, a tougher type of person, in some ways even reminding him of his mother. I think more physical than anything. I mean, she was a she was a fun person, a, a tough, fun person to be around. In fact, I think they uh, nicknamed her Bloody Mary. But uh, one night after this tavern closed, Ed shot her in the face and then took her body and brought it back to his house. Mary Hogan's death was... A mystery for a long time it remained unsolved until that day when when the police raided Ed Gein's house of horrors and one of the deputies actually recognized Mary's face I guess his her head was was still in there in a in a, in a sack or somewhere in the house so it's unbelievable but these are really the the two murders that he admitted to Mary Hogan and uh, Bernice Warden uh, he could have killed, I mean, if you exclude his brother, which I personally believe that he killed his brother, but if you ex exclude his brother, he could have killed up to six people, but he only admitted to killing those two. The other people were already dead. This is another one of those cemeteries where Ed got some of his bodies and where he would visit so this is the Spirit Land Cemetery. Just uh, the other, th there was three cemeteries. The third one was the Hancock Cemetery. Grace Beggs was, uh, this was the first body that he dug up. Not long after she died in 1947. And coincidentally, she is buried right next to the Abbott family here. This was the other person from the Spirit Land Cemetery that uh, Gein dug up. This is Alzada B. Abbott. I was not able to find all of these bodies. Um, some, there just wasn't much left. There was just bones or just, you know, skin or, or whatever. I don't even know how they could even identify some of these people. Those people were put into a mass grave, including Mary Hogan, the tavern owner, because there was just not, it, it, there wasn't enough to actually put into a grave. So as for Ed Gein himself, he was uh, found not fit to stand trial, but he did actually, over t in time, he did go through the court system where he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, which you can understand why. I mean, he really still, at that time, he thought he was a good person. He died July 26th, 1984, at 77 years old of cancer, and he died at the 
Mendota Mental Health Institute. And in the end, he got exactly what he wanted, to be eternally with his mother, next to his mother. What a crazy story. Horrific and unimaginable, but true. All right, I'm getting out of here. I've had enough uh, Ed Gein exposure to last a lifetime. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.